I'm Andy Nidell, and this is Out of the Foxholes, where I sit contemplating the existential implications of my chair of infinite knowledge, which is the other end of the room, and I answer your questions about the Second World War. As always, Time Ghost Army members get prioritized, or even guaranteed, answers. More about that at the end. Right. Our first question today comes from Time Ghost Army Private Joseph Atwell, who asks, With Mussolini ousted from power, what happened to the Italian forces in Russia, Greece, the Balkans, or otherwise not in Italy? Did the Germans force them to keep fighting? Were these Italians even aware of the ousting? Okay, so it's important to note here that although the Grand Council of Fascism formally ousted Mussolini in July 1943, the new Badoglio government initially, at least seemingly, continued to pursue the war alongside the Germans. This did not seem to provoke any immediate internal change in Italy either, with several demonstrations celebrating Mussolini's departure, but also protests against the new Badoglio government being brutally repressed. It was not until the publication of the secret armistice agreed by the Allies in Italy on September 8th and the execution of Operation Axe by the Germans, the things really began to change for Italian troops both in Italy and abroad. If you want to learn more about the timeline in general, then the episodes, I believe, were weeks 210 and 211 of the main series cover the signing of the armistice and the immediate aftermath. So, broadly speaking, Italian divisions were given an ultimatum by the Germans to disband, disarm, or collaborate with the German army. Under threat of imprisonment without POW status, they could also be deported, or there was summary execution. Unsurprisingly, Italian officers were generally not swayed by these terms and in no rush to hand themselves and their men over to German custody. In Yugoslavia, for instance, every divisional commander refused to surrender to the German authority. However, as they were cut off from supply and reinforcements, these units simply could not continue fighting as coherent fighting forces either. Many chose to take their chances by joining the partisans, some joining as whole divisions directly into partisan ranks. Other divisions in Yugoslavia were not so fortunate and found themselves under attack by German forces or forced to disintegrate and try to survive however seemed best. Some men from these disintegrated units joined the Germans, others the partisans, others tried to make their way back to Italy by land or by sea. However, the majority were forced to surrender to the Germans and were either deported or executed. In Greece, we see a fairly similar picture. However, many Italian commanders there were more trusting of German intentions and ordered their men to disarm and to hand themselves over, which they did in droves but some still took their chances with the Greek partisans or otherwise fled out of German reach. As in Yugoslavia, the Germans showed no mercy to those who resisted. One such event, the Cephalonia massacre of many thousands of the men of the Aki division, was popularized by the novel and the movie Captain Corelli's Mandolin, the movie starring Nicolas Cage and Penelope Cruz, whoever they may be, probably some actors in the future, I guess, right? Somebody shoot him, shoot him! <laughs> Sorry. On the Eastern Front, most Italian... Maybe, maybe you should mention that I cover that extensively in War Against Humanity. Oh, uh, maybe I should mention that the Cephalonia Massacre was covered extensively in the War Against Humanity series. I'll think about mentioning it, okay? On the Eastern Front, most Italian soldiers that had survived the operations well, that at... That sounded snide in me. It sounded snide? Yeah, it did. Okay, I didn't mean it to be snide. Oh, Your I series is great, Sparty, man. Don't feel insecure about anything. Man, it's great. And no. Spies and Ties, Astrid, whoa, blows me away, right? <laughs> I don't want to be snide. No, I don't feel. <clears throat> Anyhow, on the Eastern Front, most Italian soldiers that survived the operations at and after Stalingrad in early 1943 had already been repatriated to Italy, with only a small number of Italian support units continuing to operate alongside the Germans. Interestingly, the Italian smoke units had really impressed the officers of the Wehrmacht, and they had been redeployed to garrison ports in northern Germany and the Baltics. These units remained loyal to the Germans after the Italian armistice and saw action against both the Red Army and the British fighting right up to the fall of Nazi Germany. 
Big spoiler there. Right. Our next question comes from Steve Hansen, who asks... What happened to French Foreign Legion units and soldiers in French Indochina during the Japanese sham occupation by invitation and the subsequent occupation for real periods in World War II? What about the French Indochinese army and navy? What were their duties? Were they disarmed? Were they demobilized? Well, as far as I can tell, the actual French Foreign Legion was in action exclusively in Europe and North Africa, and I can't find any record of them being in Indochina up to the armistice. If you have any evidence to the contrary, then please let me know. Okay, there's still plenty to talk about if we consider French military forces in Indochina as a whole and not just the Legion. By the reckoning of General Jules Birer, chief of the colonial general staff, French forces in Indochina in 1941 totaled no fewer than 100,000 troops, 100 planes, and months worth of ammunition and supplies. Although it is important to note that a large number of these troops were irregulars. Other estimates, however, put this number closer to 50,000 combat-ready troops, mostly regular army soldiers sporting obsolete equipment. A French naval squadron consisting of the light cruiser Le Mont Piquet and a number of smaller unarmored vessels designed for colonial duties was also present. Following the agreement for the joint defense of Indochina in 1941 between Japan and Vichy France, French forces were made primarily responsible for the defense and security of northern Indochina. Japan was initially somewhat cautious in Indochina in 1940 and 41 to avoid direct conflict with Britain and the USA too soon. Crucially, as long as Governor General Jean de Coup proved willing to work with them under advisement from the Vichy regime, and the threat of Allied reinforcements entering Indochina remained really unlikely, Japan was more or less content to allow this ambiguous situation to remain. Thus, the duties of French Indochinese soldiers over this period remained largely unchanged. They remained in active service. They were not formally disarmed by the Japanese. Under the direction of General Gabriel Sabatier, contingencies were drawn up to resist any future attempt by Japan to disarm the French units. Unfortunately, these relied on the timely arrival of Allied reinforcements, which were not forthcoming, making these plans mostly pointless. But it does show the French military command was well aware of what would inevitably come at some point. The naval squadron saw action against the Thai Navy in the Franco-Thai War in 1940 and 41, winning a decisive victory at the Battle of Koh Chang. But after Japan forced a mediated peace in favor of Thailand, the squadron found itself restricted in its duties and used mostly for training purposes. That flagship, La Motte Piquet, was sunk in January 1945 by American planes after being misidentified as a Japanese ship. And after that, the naval squadron essentially ceased to exist as a capable fighting force. As the walls eventually closed in around Japan, the potential for Indochina to become a thorn in their side grew. With the liberation of France, the French officers began outwardly expressing support for de Gaulle and the Allies. Finally, on March 9, 1945, the inevitable happened, with Japanese forces executing their plan to disarm and intern the French leadership and French troops. The majority of the French forces quickly surrendered to the better equipped and more experienced Japanese troops, and they remained interned until the end of the war. Small numbers of French troops, under the command of General Sabatier and others, who had correctly predicted the coup, escaped to fight a short resistance war in the countryside. And my final question today comes from Time Ghost Army Captain Jeff Wilson, who asks, In 1943, what are the different major Allied countries thinking of the Italian Communist partisans? Does Stalin accept and support them as valid Marxist-Leninists? To what extent are the U.S. and U.K. suspicious of them as dangerous revolutionaries, etc.? Or are they just good allies against the Germans? Thanks. It's an interesting question, and it's a tricky one to answer, but, you know, that's okay. Um, in terms of the Western allies, it's very hard to give a concise answer as to what allied opinions actually were towards the end of 1943, because... They didn't really know themselves. Let me explain. Prior to the Salerno landings on September 9th, 1943, 
Resistance groups had popped up in southern and central Italy, but these were mostly small, and they didn't pose any serious threat. After the landings, the political and social situation in the south would develop quickly as dissidents found themselves with a new freedom to organize, and political exiles began to trickle back in from abroad. Soon, we end up with a diverse movement, composed mostly of communists and socialists, but also royalists and democrats. Unlike in France and Yugoslavia, the British SOE and American OSS hadn't thought Italy would develop such a large partisan movement. So Allied intelligence didn't make contact with the partisans until after regular Allied forces were already making their way up the country. Not only did this handicap the abilities of the partisans, it also meant the Allies had limited their own understanding of what was actually going on within the partisan movement. This was not helped by poor working relationships between SOE and OSS. See, while the OSS deferred to the more experienced SOE in France and Yugoslavia, they were more intent on running their own independent operations within Italy, almost like a coming of age for the American intelligence organization. It didn't help that the OSS Italian section consisted primarily of Italian-American officers who harbored a general distrust of the British. By early 1944, things had crystallized somewhat. On February 22nd, Winston Churchill made a speech to the House of Commons in which he declared the growing Italian movements could have no political or electoral authority until King Victor Emmanuel abdicated or they were invited to take office. In part, this was practical. The British and Americans believed that only Badoglio and his government could prevent Italy from sliding into chaos following Mussolini's first fall. But it was also ideological and reflected growing Western concern about communist dominance in the partisan movement. Churchill essentially rejected the legitimacy of any ambitions by the Italian communists to form their own provisional government. What about Stalin? Well, rather than focusing on ideology, Stalin took a more pragmatic approach this became apparent after Palmero Togliatti, the general secretary of the Italian Communist Party, returned to Italy in March 1944. During his wartime exile in the Soviet Union, Togliatti had grown close to Stalin, with the pair exchanging frequent direct correspondence. He stood firmly behind Stalin's own vision and immediate aims for the future of Europe. Following Stalin's advice, Togliatti executed the Svolta di Salerno, or the Salerno Turn, which called on the revolutionary communist movements to work with the Western Allies and Badoglio's government. As part of this, the partisans reached a deal with the Italian government whereby they would disarm in exchange for the legitimization of the Communist Party within the Italian political system. In Stalin's view, a chaotic and weakened Italy, plagued by revolutions and infighting, would only benefit the Western allies. They held the balance of power in the country. They would be able to repress a militant communist movement after the war. On the other hand, departing from revolutionary ambitions and gaining immediate recognition from the allies and the Badoglio government would make Togliatti and the Communist Party untouchable after the war. Stalin believed that this was the only way Moscow could continue to wield influence in post-war Italy. This policy bore fruit almost immediately. Togliatti himself became deputy prime minister under Badoglio's government of national unity in December 1944. The electoral popularity of the Communist Party skyrocketed as a result, emerging as one of the strongest and most legitimate communist movements in post-war Western Europe. By 1946, it had two million members. Now, I could talk all day, you better believe it, about Italian internal politics, which is really interesting, actually. Ask more questions about that. But we'll have to leave that for now. And hey, I want to make a big shout out to Tom Aldis for doing research and writing for this uh, Out of the Foxholes. I have a lot on my plate with writing the chaos of the European war in April and May 1945 at the moment. Tom is an historian in England who's just begun doing work for us. His dad's also really cool here. This is Tom. He made light work of a very messy situation over there in Italy. Almost a tangled spaghetti of communist politics. Communist spaghetti. Hey, if we ever open a Time Ghost restaurant, man, that's going to be on the menu, right, Sparty? Oh, will you really order communist spaghetti, though? 
Okay, I'd order it once to see if it's any good. And, 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 you gotta think, the proportions of all the ingredients would ideally all be the same, and the spaghetti itself would control the means of production. So maybe it wouldn't be very good. Okay, anyhow, if you have a question of your own, feel free to drop by at community.timeghost.tv and ask away. Or you can join the Time Ghost Army at timeghost.tv or patreon.com to help us, help us keep doing what we're doing. Time Ghost Army members get priority with their questions. If you subscribe at the captain level or higher, you get a guaranteed answer for your question. We're starting our new series on the Korean War soon, so there has never been a better time to join the Time Ghost Army. So get over to Patreon or TimeGhost.tv. Don't miss out on the tangled ramen of Korean communist politics. But, absolutely, do not leave your question in the comments below. If you do, I won't answer it, Tom won't answer it, and there'll be no communist carbohydrate-based foods for anyone. See you next time. Mm -hmm.